We all search for that spark which fuels our desire to fully engage in our lives. We look for the courage to experience moments where we can come alive instead of watching life pass us by. You're listening to The Front Row Factor, leaving fear and insecurity behind by exploring stories of top performers that are living life in the front row. Get ready to stand up, step up, and live it up with your host, John Vroman. What's up, Front Row family? John Vroman here. I'm excited you're with me today for my chat with John David Mann. He is a New York Times bestselling author, and I first heard his name when he co-authored The Go-Giver with Bob Berg, who is recently on our show. Now, John has won all sorts of awards for his writing. His books are published in more than two dozen languages and has sold more than two million copies. Now, a bit about his life. When he was growing up at age 17, he and a few friends started their own high school in New Jersey. We get into that more during the interview. He has been a concert cellist, a prize-winning composer. In fact, his musical compositions were performed throughout the U.S., and his musical score, written at age 13, was performed in Greece, where the play originally premiered. And during the 90s, John built a multi-million dollar sales distribution organization with thousands of people on his team. All of this before taking the world by storm with his incredible books. Now, during the show, we talk about how he is able to write four books at one time, We dig into writing habits and philosophies about co-writing on projects. Our chat spans from everything from life as a kid to thoughts on death, his thoughts about how his accomplishments in music have influenced his writing, thoughts on appreciation in life and how that plays a role, what John stands for, and he shares the story of just how much rejection they faced with the Go-Giver book uh, before it was published and now has sold more than 500,000 copies. Got over 800 five-star reviews on Amazon. We talk about that and so much more. I did not want this interview to end. Ladies and gentlemen, enjoy my chat with John David Mann. All right, Front Row family, I'm here with John David Mann. What's up, John? Hey, everything's up. <laughs> hey, thanks for uh, joining us this morning. Really appreciate you taking the time. Why don't we kick off with a highlight reel of your life? What can we celebrate together this morning? What's going well in your world that we can talk about and highlight? A highlight reel. <laughs> well, of course, I just released with Bob Berg, my buddy and writing partner. I just released a new book called The Go-Giver Leader. Is fun for us. It's always a blast for us to, to go back and visit Pindar's town. So those of you, you have read The Go-Giver, Go-Giver Leader is, takes place, uh, you know, an undefined time later in the same universe. I'm writing four books at once beyond that right now. It's making me crazy. <laughs> now, John, we got to stay there for a quick second. Currently, you're writing four books? I don't recommend trying this at home. <laughs> I Normally, I would have to go here later, but I've got to get into this right away. Tell us about what does that look like in your day, man? How do you balance four books? Is it chunks? Do you spend a week on one, a week on another? And It's kind of like this. It's sort of that. So I have right now four books that are in different stages. Although, you know, ordinarily I have a number of books in different stages. You know, one book's already finished, but we're still kind of uh, proofreading or revising or, or, you know, polishing. One book is in just the preliminary stage where we're outlining and, and conceiving and maybe making a proposal, one book I'm writing. So books are in different stages. Actually working on a book, actually doing the writing, the heavy lifting, so to speak, of uh, being deep in the process, normally I can only do that with one book at a time. But I'll work for a week or two weeks, you know, or even three, four, five days on this particular project, and then maybe set it aside and pick up something else if I have to. I would rather just go for two months, boom, on one project. But life doesn't always provide that opportunity. That's right. Because things come up. So as it happens right at the moment, I'm in a phase where I'm, I'm finishing a book that I've actually it's written, and that we're just kind of tweaking it really before presenting it to publishers, which is another parable. And I'm excited about that book. And I have three other books that are at the exact same point, which is I'm starting them and I'm going, ah! Yeah, that works. that's so great. Is your writing style kind of the secret sauce or can you talk a little bit about what does a day in the life of John David Mann look like? Like a place that you write or do you stand and sit? And Good one. I like that. So there are a few answers to that. The first is that one of the things I've learned in listening to a lot of interviews with writers, novelists, journalists, you know, entertainment writers, any kind of writer I've listened to. Barnes & Noble had this wonderful series called Meet the Writer years ago where they had interviews 
fairly short interviews, but with writers all across the boards, and they were fascinating. And to me, the most fascinating thing about that series was how different everyone's routine is. I mean, there are writers who can only write when they're alone in the room with the headset on, the music, and it's totally quiet. There are writers who only write like in the coffee shop surrounded by chaos. It's so interesting. John Irving, the novelist, starts plays with it with a story idea in his head for years and then writes the last sentence of the book, which in some cases becomes the title of the book in more than one case. The World According to Garp was the last sentence in the book. That last night at Twisted River was the last sentence in the book. He'll write the last sentence and then work his way backward. Like what happened before that, before that, before that, and go back to the beginning of the book. Writes the book in his head backwards. Once he gets to the beginning, he says, okay, I know the story now. And then he writes it forwards. I mean, I don't know how that man does ever do that. But so everyone, everyone is different. That's my point. But so for me, I've got sort of three different modes of writing. When I am, to me, the hardest part of writing is in the beginning point where I don't know what it is. You know, I've heard this from women that the, the most difficult time of pregnancy often is the first few months when everything is changing, but it doesn't show. So no, it isn't like people give you the seat in the bus or anybody, you know, nobody knows you're pregnant because you don't look pregnant because there's nothing happening that's outwardly obvious, but inside it's a maelstrom. You know, by the time you're bulging, you know, your body is kind of settled into it. And yeah, you can tell you have back hurts and so forth. But I always think about that in terms of writing. For me, the hardest part of the book is when there's nothing to show, when nothing is showing yet. There's no baby book. From I'm trying to figure out what is this book, um, even when I know what it is. Like right now, I'm writing a, a business book with a Navy SEAL. And what is that book? I have an outline, but I'm still not quite sure sort of the What's the approach of the book? What's the essence of the book? I don't quite know what it is. And that is the most thrilling part, the most difficult part. And I don't do that at the computer. I'll go in the shower. I'll take a walk. I'll take a drive. Or I'll sit and I'll doodle. And where I first get ideas to start to get concrete in the page, I cannot do it at the keyboard. Uh, I have to take a pad of paper and a pen and go sit in my chair that you can't see. It's behind me. Yep. There it is. There it is. Back there. So I have to go sit in my chair and have a cup of tea and kind of mess around and make my brain empty and go, I have no idea what I'm doing. I have no idea what this is. And sort of just let ideas pop up. So the brainstorming part for me is, can be kind of excruciating. It's very difficult, but it's also the thrilling part. Once I have ideas going and I have content, then I'll, I'll work at my computer. And I, I'm very happy typing. I love my keyboard. I love, you know. But it's two different modes. The actual working mode in the computer, it's when already the book's already been planted, the tree's already planted and I'm just growing it. The initial brainstorming mode is, is a very formless, weird thing. Oh, that's so cool. Do you notice that uh, it takes a particular amount of time? Is it always different? Does it hit you in the evening or the morning? Does it, have you noticed any patterns emerging over the years as to when the idea might come to you? Yes, best in the morning. I'm freshest in the morning. You know, my favorite writing periods are when I'm at the beginning of a project and I get up in the morning, cup of hot tea, get in my chair. You know, I'm still halfway between sleep and awake almost. So yeah, morning is great for fresh ideas for creativity, morning to into, into early afternoon. By afternoon on, I'm great for polishing, refining, editing, correspondence, you know, what have you. But yeah, that fresh early morning energy is what works for me. I used to be a night person. I used to get brainstorms at, you know, one in the morning. I don't do that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I have dreams at one in the morning. <laughs> That's nice. Very cool. John, I want to stay on the book subject here for a minute. I want to talk about The Go-Giver Leader, and I, there's a million questions there. But let's back it up a little bit and go back to your life as a kid. And just for a moment or two, let's just hang here for a second and tell us what was life like for you growing up? I mean, as a kid, I was like any kid, you know, full of energy, playing ball out in the street, going to school and so forth with my friends and, and everything. But I also grew up in a musical family. My father was a choral conductor and a musicologist. So he was both a, you know, a scholar of music and also a performer of music. And uh, my mom was a, a teacher. She taught English. She taught history. But she also taught drama. She wrote plays for her kids. She was very involved in drama, classical drama, Shakespeare, the Greek dramas and so forth. So I, I kind of grew up in an arts house. Yeah. My older brother was a musician. My younger brother's a musician. I was a musician. And my career 
as my first career was in music, classical music. I played the cello, I uh, performed the concertizer in a symphony, I gave recitals, I was a composer. That was my kind of my career, that was my plan. My plan keeps changing, <laughs> keeps getting changed. So I was very involved in music, classical music, but I became intensely interested in I don't even know what to call it, but Mr. Fuller, Marshall McLuhan, you know, people with innovative kind of thought about where the future was going, where society was going. And also became very interested in health and natural health and natural food and sort of the whole wellness idea. So I took a career shift as a teenager. When I was 17, I, I uh, was involved with a group of friends and I started a high school. We, we didn't feel we were learning a lot of our own schools. So we decided to create our own school. I love this. <laughs> this, is, this is great. And the cool thing about it was that a few of us had parents who took us seriously. Instead of saying, don't be ridiculous, how can you start a school? They said, hey, keep talking about this. You should, you know, they, they, were, they were supportive. And my parents particularly, they allowed me to drop out of school and pursue our new school as a full-time project. Outstanding. Which I did. And we started it when I was 17. We started the school. When I was in my senior year, I went to the school. And then I graduated from it and went back as part of the faculty and taught there for a year, I guess, before I moved on. And uh, that was a cool experience because it, it showed me that, you know, it showed me all, a number of things. But one thing it obviously showed me is just because it looks like something is impossible, don't take that at face value. The idea that we could create this school and that it would work and that we would have graduates go on. We had no certification. We had no accreditation, but we had our graduates go on to places like Harvard and, and, and Yale and state schools and, you know, all over the place. So, yeah, anything is, in fact, possible. That's so great. Going back to this music part of your life, John, how has the music piece informed your writing world? When I was in high school, before I left, before I dropped out, when I was in the regular school, I would spend time in classes that bored me silly with music paper. I put music piece of music paper down. I would try to write out the melody or the, the, the melodic line of a piece that I'd heard on a record, some classical piece, whatever. And I would do my best to get all the turns and all the harmonic changes and all everything on there. And then I would go home and I'd listen to it and I would see where I had gotten it a little bit off. And I, I, I loved doing that. And I say that because it was practice in trying to catch an idea that is almost elusive and beyond grasp and get it down and get it onto paper. That to me is the, is the trickiest part of writing is to catch at an idea and get it on, on paper without damaging it in the process. So I think being a composer and being a musician has really informed the way I approach writing. I have a very, a very structural view of writing. I'm, I'm always thinking about, so here's how it is at the beginning, where is it going at the end, and how things come full circle, which is a big part of classical music. You have a symphony or a sonata, something that stretches, you know, 20, 30 minutes, and often there's, you know, there's grand arch kind of form going on. And so I sort of look at a book or an article or a blog post as if it were a musical composition. It's just kind of natural to me because that's my native language, so to speak. John, if you could only listen to one piece of classical music... For the rest of your life, which one would be on repeat? <laughs> um, I think it would probably be, there's this piece by Bach for solo violin at the end of his D minor sonata, D minor partita, sonata, partita, I forget which, uh, it's called the Chacon, and it's, just, it's a very famous piece for solo violin. It's this magnificent, it's like a symphonic piece for solo violin, and I think it would have to be that. But there'd be a lot of contenders. Very cool. Have you ever seen the video of uh, Joshua Bell in the train station? This you seen that? Yeah, yeah, right. The train station, right? People walk by and throw them change and stuff. The Washington Post. Yeah. For those of you who are listening that don't know what John and I are talking about, it was uh, it was years ago. The Washington Post wanted to see what would happen if you put one of the greatest is it what would I say violinist? Yep. Yeah. Into a, a subway station and had him play an amazing piece and. A thousand people in an hour walked by, 33 slowed down, seven paused, and one woman stood there with her jaw on the ground because she knew it was Joshua yeah. Bell. And she's like, what are you doing here? <laughs> Such an amazing video to watch because for me, I extracted from that, uh, you know, the idea of how many people do I walk by that are absolutely brilliant that I judge too quickly 
perhaps because of the context or the environment that they might be in. But if I would just be a little more inquisitive, if I'd be a little more curious, I would find some brilliance within that person. Yeah. I mean, and how often do we just do that with people around us? The taking for granted thing. That's right. You know, my wife many years ago broke her knee, not too many years ago, maybe a decade ago, broke her knee. It was a compound fracture, like 18 breaks. I mean, it was an awful, awful break. Oh, that sounds horrible. And the worst part about it was that initially it was misdiagnosed. They thought it wasn't broken. They just told her to stop being a baby and walk on it, which she did. Oh. (laughs) Weeks, only making it worse. So it was really, really bad. It took a long time to heal. It did heal eventually. And then some years later, she broke it again. Oh, my gosh. The moral of that or the point of that is, and she did recover and she's done extraordinary things. And she has an amazing background in wellness and health. And she's she's very, very savvy. And she now, you you wouldn't tell. We go to our, our step classes at the YMCA and you wouldn't even know to look at her that she ever had a break. But we are both so grateful just for walking. Yeah. Just to literally to walk out of my room to the kitchen and come back. Every time I do it, I'm like, walking, this thing is just amazing that we do with these legs. It's just incredible. There is, it's, it's the, the Joshua Bell is everywhere in our lives. It's just amazing. Yeah, that's right. And has she stopped parachuting without the parachute since then? <laughs> um, she has, has cut back on the kickbox. <laughs> right, right. Excellent. Very good. Hey, on the topic of gratitude, John, um, how do you, one of the questions that we ask our community often is how do you celebrate life? You know, living life in the front row is oftentimes about a celebration. And I shared with you earlier, you know, within the charity, we celebrate people's lives and it's a big part of who we are. I think celebration, gratitude, appreciation is key. How do you celebrate your life? Um, Do you have traditions each day, kind of an evening routine where you look back on the day and talk about what you're grateful for? You know, there's this beautiful moment in the in the movie. I'm trying to remember the name of the movie. Meryl Streep played Julia Child. I don't recall the name. It was Julia and Julia. Oh, that's yeah. right. Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. Great movie. So there's a moment where she and her husband are sitting in Paris, and she hasn't figured out that she's Julia Child yet, of Julia Child fame. They're sitting and they're eating, and she's kind of trying to figure out what to do with her life, and they're eating something, and she goes, mm, 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 and he, her husband just says, I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's, my, it's my wife and my, one of our favorite scenes, because Almost every day we're eating breakfast or we're eating dinner. We love to cook together. We, we love to eat. We love to cook. And we'll be eating something. And one of us will go, mm, and the other one just says, I know. <laughs> That's great. One of the things that I love about our relationship is uh, I've been married three times. This is my third time. Third time is a charm. You got this. You got it. Uh, yeah. It took us until 50, our 50s to, you know, to find where we were meant to go in the first place. But one of the things I love about a relationship is that we are constantly expressing our appreciation for the simplest things, walking, delicious food, our dog, our other dog, each other. Uh, You asked about ritual. Every morning I bring her a cup of hot tea in bed. And I've been doing this for, I don't know, eight, nine, 10, 11 years. And every day she just tells me, thank you so much for bringing me that tea. It's just so sweet. I really appreciate it. I mean, we have been through, I guess, enough heartache and pain in our lives so that we're at a point where we remember what it's like to not be happy or to not have something so that we constantly have expressed appreciation. There was a time I was working on a book about happiness where I I delved into the scientific research about gratitude and about the brain and about, and of course, there's so much research out there, but it is, for anyone who doesn't know, it is a well-established fact that The practice of gratitude, the regular practice, the daily practice of simple gratitude is one of the most profound factors in your state of well-being, in your happiness. It even affects your health, your physical health. It affects your career. It affects uh, your relationships. It affects your whole life in an extraordinarily positive way. And it's so accessible. That's right. Well, John, on the topic of gratitude, I want to thank you for writing the books that you have and sharing them with the world. I shared with Bob recently when we were in a chat that uh, The Go-Giver was hugely influential for me, which I read back in July 2010. And since then, have given many copies away. Our mutual friend, Stacy Martino, is also a huge fan. And she just is, uh, she's an advocate and a believer. So thank you for, thank you. I just want to appreciate you and celebrate you for a moment here of the work that you've put in to creating something that has a massive impact on the world. The Go-Giver Leader is the newest of the books of the Go-Giver series. And uh, so let me ask you this. When, when you meet somebody for the first time, many people in our audience are meeting you. How do you describe that book? 
How do you sum it up for people who are asking what it's about? The go-giver leader, yeah. Or, or you can answer that any way you like, of course. It's a story. It's a parable. It's a business parable. It's business. It's really more about life than about business per se, but it's about, so it's like the go-giver. It's a story that illustrates a lot of ideas, but there is a central idea. It's about leadership. So I'm going to make, I'm going to, this is going to come in, in bits and pieces. I'm not going to be as succinct as I'd like it to be. But the first thing I guess I'd say is we often tend to think about leadership. The idea makes us think about the CEO, the president, the prime minister, the boss, the general, the person at the top of something large. The person that has unusual and rare position of authority over uh, something massive. But leadership happens everywhere. Leadership is in our families. Leadership is in our relationships. Leadership is in our small business groups. Leadership is, you know, we, we all have access to leadership and are called on to lead in various ways. So the first thing is that we see leadership as being something that applies to really everyone. To the degree that you do something first, that you champion someone, that you stand for an idea, that you take an initiative, that whatever you do, that you do that no one has done before, you're by definition taking the lead. It, there's leadership is everywhere. So the book is about leadership and about how we influence, best influence other people. The core idea of the book is that it's the same idea as the core idea of the go-giver. The go-giver's core idea was shifting our focus from me to others, you know, from, from getting to giving to how is all this going to benefit me to how can I benefit others? Making that shift from here to there isn't just a nice and noble and moral thing to do. It's, it's strategically practical. It's an, it's an effective thing to do because it makes you a more effective person. It makes you more effective in business. It makes you more effective in your influence in society. It makes you more effective in your relationships. It makes you more effective in your family. It makes you just a more effective person. And I use the word effective in the broadest possible sense. It creates a bigger life. And it often leads to unexpected returns. The universe operates in mysterious ways, often way beyond our comprehension. I like to say that nobody knows what you need better than you do, except for the rest of the universe. <laughs> the world knows our heart, I like to say, better than we do. I mean, the, the, often, if you think about what are the best things that ever happened to you in your life, and then you look at each one of them, lay them out on the table and say, now, which ones of those did I plan? <laughs> right. I know the answer for me is zero. Right. I never planned to meet the woman of my dream. I didn't know who she was. I never planned to write The Go-Giver with Bob. I never planned so many things that have worked uh, out right. the greatest things in my life. In my life. So The Go-Giver Leader, the idea is that it goes, the book goes through what we call the five keys to legendary leadership. And they're all different principles of leadership. Because leadership has fascinated both Bob and, and myself for, for all our lives. But the fundamental principle underneath all of them is that you become the most effective leader when your focus is on others. We like to say that you can take leadership, and taking leadership can be a great thing to do, but far more powerful is giving leadership. Giving leadership to others, championing others, raising others, holding others up. When you, we like to say that you, the way to, to strengthen your influence is to give it away. The more you give, the more, stronger your influence becomes. That's the core idea of the, of the leadership. That's great. I love it. Stacy Martino actually sent me an email this morning and she said, I read it last week and it was amazing. So she's, I actually have an email to forward to you from her. It was, uh, it's really powerful. John, for you, when people do read the book, yeah. is there a certain or specific response that you've been getting more than any other something that's been revealed through the audience to you that this part of the book is hitting home with them maybe more than any other a specific key any one of the five that tends to draw people in more than others we're still early enough in the book where are we april 14th so it, it, when we're, we're speaking so it's the book's been out for less than a month we're still early enough so that i don't know that i could i've, I've heard you know Different people respond to, to different ones. We saw this with the go-giver too. You know, hold the vision. The idea of the leader, effective leader is the one who's visionary, who sees the big picture and who doesn't get distracted by difficulties and by hardships and always has that the end game in mind. That's an extremely powerful thing. Some people are naturally gifted at that. Some people aren't. 
the idea of, of build your people, that leadership is about building the people on the team, the idea of do the work, that leadership is about the person who actually understands the nuts and bolts of how the thing is made and isn't afraid to get his, his fingers dirty and get in the mud. All these different ideas people respond to differently. With the go-giver, I would say it took about maybe three, four, five months after that book was released for us to start seeing that everybody was kind of leaning toward the same idea in that book, which was really interesting. Um, I'll, I'll just jump back to that book for a second. Yeah, please do. Yeah. So with The Go-Giver, there were five laws of stratospheric success. And what we have over the years heard far and away above and beyond anything other, any other response was those first four laws, I get those. I'm with you on those. The fifth law, that's, I'm still working on that. In The Go-Giver, the fifth law, the first four laws are all about different aspects of giving. Your true worth is determined by how much more you give in value than you take in payment. They're all aspects of giving and, and giving to others. The fifth law is that the key to effective giving is to stay open to receiving. It's about being receptive. It's called the law of receptivity. And it's about allowing yourself to be the recipient of somebody else's giving. And it's really funny. People are still constantly telling us, I'm still working on that. I have a hard time with that. And you know, one way of measuring that is, you know, think back to the last time somebody gave you a compliment. It, it's you know, almost universally, people when they get compliments, they get uncomfortable and say, "Oh no, oh nothing," you know, it, it was nothing really, or whatever. People have have awkwardness about receiving, as if it is somehow evidence of selfishness, or the, or maybe it's a sense of unworthiness. Or I don't want to get psychoanalytical about it, but it's it's the it's the sore spot for people. I think that in, in the, in the go-giver leader, I expect that we'll see, but I don't know this for sure, but we'll see that, that that fifth law, again, is the one that people kind of go, ooh, I get that. Here's what I think happens. The fifth law of the go-giver leader is about giving leadership. The fifth key is to practice giving leadership. And there's something about leadership that is interesting. When you are in a leadership position, whether it's you know titled and named and in a large context, official, or whether it's it's more informal and unnamed, but still you are like the one in your in your little group that everybody else looks to. You know, the one that everyone kind of sees as being a leader of the group. Being in a leadership place creates a sort of gravitational field. It generates like an electrical gravitational field that starts to make you feel, it can start to make you feel like you're pretty hot stuff. You start to feel like, yeah, I know what I'm doing. I have good ideas. <laughs> it's said that, you know, Lord Acton said that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. I don't know that power corrupts, but power does tend to influence um, your, your view of yourself. In the book, The Go-Giver Leader, we say, don't ever get confused and think that you are the deal. The moment leaders start to think that they are the deal is the moment they start, you start to lose grip on what we call giving leadership. It's why there is a constant cycle in, in, uh, in monarchies of, of deposing monarchs and revolutionaries and why the power structure tends to eat, eat its young because people get sucked into their own gravitational field and stop listening, stop looking, stop empathizing and start thinking that they know the answers. It's a universal challenge of, of leadership. And that's what the fifth law is designed to, to, to deal with. You know, when you talk about uh, great leaders and it's not about a title, i reminded of a woman who I met almost 20 years ago who maybe was one of the greatest leaders that I've ever encountered. And uh, what happened was I pulled up to a toll booth just on a typical drive. And this woman who collected my money, she looked at me and she said, hey, how you doing? As I hand her my $3, I just said, I'm excellent. Thanks. And I, that was a great answer. But she looked at me and she got this really stern look on her face like it was angry, like I had offended her somehow. And she paused and then she pointed right at me and she waited for like two or three seconds. And I thought, oh, my God, what did I do? And she <laughs> goes, you are super fantastic. And she threw her <laughs> hand up in the air and just got this huge smile on her face. And I went from being in a great mood to being in an outstanding mood. I, she made me laugh. I drove down the road. And as I drove down the road, John, I, I, I bet it hit me. I thought, does she do this to every single <laughs> car? 
Can you imagine? I mean, that's a long day at the toll booth. I mean, I get you could be really enthusiastic for the first one, two, or ten, but two hours in, would you still be doing that? I yeah. thought, man, if she does that, she could be famous, you yeah. know? <laughs> and then, no kidding, this is a true story. Months later, I'm in my living room, I'm watching TV, and there's a commercial that appears, and out of the commercial shoots the woman and she says, try it, it's super fantastic. And I stood up in my living room and I was like screaming at the TV. I was like, you did it, you're famous. <laughs> I was celebrating with this woman. And uh, what I realized from that was that I, I said, wow, what a great example of how people approach the world. So on one hand, you've got somebody who metaphorically would say, I work at a toll booth or literally, and they would say, what difference can I make? You know, and that sounds like I'm just a high school student. I haven't even graduated yet. What difference can I make? Or I'm just in college. I don't even have a job yet. What difference can I make? Or, you know, I just got the job. I'm brand new here. I'm not the manager. What difference can I make? And then it's, I'm just the manager. I'm not the owner of the company. I've got these handcuffs <laughs> on. What difference can I make? And then they're like, well, I'm just the owner of the company. I'm not the governor setting the rules for the state. And and then it's like, you know, I'm just the governor, I'm not the president. And then the president's like, I don't run Congress. How do I make a difference? And everybody along the way, except this woman, you know, said, I work at a toll booth. What difference can I make? And I think, I think that it's just so great that people can be a go-giver and a leader right now. Like at this exact moment of their lives, like today, in the next hour, in the next, you know, that's... That's what I think is so brilliant. And I, why I think everybody needs to read your book is that they need to embrace that power starting immediately. And I think our world depends on it. You know, it's like high school students starting a high school. You know, what? That's right. Yeah, perfect. Super fantastic. I love that's a great story, man. I, <laughs> I, you know, what's great is that's, a, that's such a great tie, John, that also it's that you were in that place and said, what can we do? Like, how can we change things? How can we, wasn't that the name of the high school? Did you say this earlier? Changes, Change, actually, changes, changes, Inc. changes, Inc. I mean, come on, that's just brilliant. I, really bravo. That's so cool. So number four key of the go-giver leader, John, is, yeah. is to stand for something. Yep. So my question for you is what do you stand for in your life? Great, great question. <laughs> So just to slide into that, the first three keys, I sort of consider the ABCs of leadership. You know, hold the vision, that's the big picture. Do the work, let's understand the nuts and bolts. I like leaders who understand what it's like to be in the front line, what it's like to be preparing the food, what it's like to be building the widget, what it's like to be actually laying out the, the newspaper on the cutout board. And build your people is what comes in between. It's the fabric of the business. Those are the ABCs. The fourth is what gives the enterprise depth stand for something is really all about character and the idea of that is that the attributes of key four often don't show up in a resume or they aren't in a job description the way the first three might be but they are what make an influence a business's influence or an enterprise's influence or an organization's influence really grow what is the person at the top stand for where you have to be fluid and flexible in business, but there are times where you don't bend, where you can't be flexible. There's some things you won't compromise on. What, you know, what, where do you make your stand? That's kind of the idea of that. For me, I have a big thing about truth. One of the things I've done for years, for, for decades, is uh, whenever I hear one of those things that people quote, I like to chase it down and find out if that's what the person really said. Is that how the quote really went? Did this guy really say that? People say, you know, uh, there was a study by an insurance company that so many people wrote down their goals and of those who wrote down their goals, this percent actually lived this much longer. Did they really have that study? I've chased down and debunked. Bob Berg loves to do this too. We've debunked an awful lot of commonly accepted truths because they're not truths. I am really big on truth. Also, something else that I have always taken a stand for is excellence. Uh, mediocrity drives me nuts. I was actually, somebody asked me this question a few days ago in the air. I said, you know, what do you stand for? And I was saying excellence. I am a stand for excellence and I'm a stand for truth. And she said something which I thought was interesting. She said, you know, I think you also have always taken a stand for respect. And I hadn't thought about that. But I guess, I guess that that's true. I have, for example, enormous respect for our readers, for people who, and Bob is the same way. And I'm sure you know this. 
anybody who writes into us about our books, I mean, they're going to get our attention. Anybody who comments on our website, anybody who comments in the blog post, anybody who comments in the Twitter feed, I mean, we really love each one of those people is a person, is a whole universe as much as anybody else is. One of the things that actually took me out of classical music was that I found myself on the stage performing music and looking out the audience and seeing a lot of people who didn't seem happy to me. I mean, they were happy at the concert, but I felt like I wasn't, I was giving, giving them some temporary enjoyment, but I didn't feel like I was, I was serving them as effectively as, as maybe I could. And that's how I got into wellness and all of that. So, I mean, one of the things that the most satisfying and fulfilling thing for me about these Go-Giver books is just the number of lives we've touched. I just, it's absolutely thrilling to know that there are, you know, hundreds of thousands of folks out there whose lives have been in some way impacted positively by what they read in the book. And it's not like there's any idea in there that's radical or revolutionary or that we thought of. It's all old ideas, old as the hills. Um, it's just a question of trying to phrase them in a form that people can kind of get them and remember them. Uh, I think I just digressed from your question. No, you didn't. I mean, I think you answered it great. It was perfect. It was, you know, I think that what I gathered from that was the idea of how much you respect your this started with excellence and then transitioned into respect. And I love that you have such respect for your audience. I feel that way, by the way, from you, from our communications, from my chats with Bob, you know, that there's just, you guys are the good guys. My dad was a Navy captain for many years. And, you know, he always used to talk about good guys. He would yeah. talk about guys in the military and he's like, he'd be with his buddies and I'd hear him in the kitchen, you know, growing up and he'd be like, oh, good guy, good guy. He was a good guy. <laughs> yeah. And that's that term good guy really stands out in my mind. And I think of you and Bob as good guys. And I like seeing good guys win. But I, I really do. I love seeing good guys who care for people who are out there with the right morals and values and principles. And, and they have a real heart for helping people. And I think that's the two of you that describes you very well. You know, Working with uh, my other, I have, I've written a lot of books, a lot of writing partners, but the, beyond Bob Berg, the other writing partner who's become, you know, a huge part of my life is Brandon Webb, the former Navy SEAL. He was a Navy SEAL sniper who taught the, the, the sniper course. And I, I have no military background personally. My, both me and my wife, are, our dads were in, in the army, but I have the military background, but Brandon and I have just clicked like that. And it's around these, these same kind of values, what you call good guy. I mean, I've loved working with him. We're, we're doing more books together still. That's awesome. Great. John, what's a question you wish people would ask you more often during interviews like this? <laughs> what is the writing process like with uh, two people? I mean, I actually do get that question. I love that question. I love questions about the writing process. You know, where did this come from? Where did that come from? But yeah, what's the writing process like? And also, you know, is there any, any basis in reality in the book? Is it book based on anybody? Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Well, let's talk about the writing process here in a second. But I want to I want to set this up for a moment by do you at every party that you go to now, do people pitch you their book? Are they like, hey, John, John, wait a minute. I got I got the book for you. Like, is is this part of what your your year looks like is I want to devote at least 10 percent of my time to listening to people pitch me the story if they got the next great idea for a big book? I actually I do get a, a lot of book ideas. Yeah. That, but they're not, I got a great idea for a book. They're like, I got a book that I'd like you to write with me. I'll answer every one of them. And in some cases, I've been able to match somebody up with another writer or match somebody up with an agent or give good advice or whatever. But, you know, there's a limit to how many books I can write. <laughs> uh, of course, 100%. Well, now let's stick with that for a second before we get into the co-writing process. And selfishly, I want to ask this question because sometimes I think, oh, I've got this great idea and, oh, that would be really neat. I've had people come to me and talk to me about co-authoring books. So as we get to the part where it actually happens and what it's like to work with a co-author, what advice would you give to somebody about finding a co-author, finding that person or finding a match? Or even if they said, hey, if you've got an idea and you want to go to John, here's what you do and here's what you don't do. You mean somebody's looking for a writer to participate? Yeah, yeah, a partner. No, I wish I had more solid practical advice for that question because I don't really know. I have a, you know, a circle of writers that I know who I have sometimes uh, hooked up with certain projects. But again, our, our, you know, we're only two or three people and, we're, and <laughs> time is limited. So, yeah, I don't really have great advice for how to find a co-writer other than to, you know, standard advice of look, look at other books that you want that you, that you want to emulate or that you like and see who wrote that and see if you can, you know, just in networking, trying to get in touch with people, in touch with people who, who have done that, that writing. 
when people come to you with an offer, as an example, like say, hey, hey, John, let's do this book. Do they send you a proposal? Are they emailing you a video? Are they taking you out to dinner? Are they? Is it by way of an introduction of another person? Is there a way that particularly for you does catch your attention more or you appreciate? Here's how most of my book projects start. They're either someone that I know that I've worked with, like it happened with Bob Berg and me. I had edited his stuff in another journal. The people that I already are in my circle of acquaintance already that we have a book idea or a book idea comes through my agent. Uh, I have a, a literary agent who's been a huge part of Bob's in my life for many, many years. She was the person who got the go-giver originally sold. You know, it was rejected 22 times. No way. Yeah. That's incredible. I read a blog post about this, you know, three, four months ago and, and detailed all the responses from all the editors. No you know, way. Yeah. Interesting, but not what I'm looking for. I don't think it's really prime. Not really done. Rejection after rejection after rejection after rejection. And it was, I think it was the 22nd or it was the 23rd time. I counted them out before Adrian Zakheim at Portfolio a Division of Penguin said, uh, we want that book. That's great. Good for you, Adrian. Now, 800 plus five-star reviews on Amazon later. Yeah, yeah. Half a million copies later, Adrian made the right choice. It's like, that's my Colonel Sanders story. And it's of all those rejections. And it is a fact. That's absolutely factual. Personally, I get a lot of, most of my projects come through my agent. My agent has someone with a great story and she comes to me. So that's a, that's a great contact point. Or people just email me. They have, I have this idea for a story. What do you think? If I have some place where I can place that idea, if I know a writer or an agent or someone who, then I, I can try to make a connection. But, you know, the majority of them, honestly, I, I, I can't because they're just not enough places in, in the world and time, hours in the day. Sure. Yeah, totally. All right. So let's talk for a second about the uh, co-writing process. What is that like? Uh, so for me, you know, there's this series of books by Stephen King and Peter Straub. Most of what I read, by the way, is fiction. I, I write nonfiction and I read fiction. They wrote these two books. One is called The Talisman and the follow-up book is called The Black House. And they're, they're both just amazing books, but they, they co-wrote these. They co-wrote in a way that is not what I do. What they do is King would write a chapter or a section, email it to Straub. Straub takes it and goes, cool, and then write some more and sends it back. So they would actually like leapfrog, writing, section, writing, writing, writing. That's not generally how my, how my work goes. So with The Go-Giver, or let me just step away from The Go-Giver for a second. If I'm writing a memoir or somebody else's life, like Brandon Webb, the Navy SEAL, his life called The Red Circle, how that works is we get in the phone and we have a series of, of one hour conversations, maybe 10, 20 conversations. And he'll, he'll tell me his whole story. I'll ask questions, he'll tell me his story. It's interview process. I'll take the interview, I'll chunk it down, and out of that, brrr, I will write a book. That's how a lot of my books are, are written because I'm writing somebody else's story. And so it's really their story, my writing. With a go-giver, it's different because go-giver is like Bob and I are 50-50 are of its DNA. You know, it's, it's really both of us. Bob had the idea for the story and he had maybe 20 pages or some number, some, a, a body of draft material that he'd sketched out. And so it was kind of like an idea. Uh, some characters, some scenes, a chapter, blah, blah. And so he delivered that to me and said, what do you think? And we got together, as you said, we got together. I, I, first I thought, I just don't see it. I don't see this book working. I didn't get the, I just, I couldn't see it. And I was busy. I didn't have time for this. So, uh, but it was Bob. And this often happens to me that I will think something is not a good idea, but I look at the, at the place where maybe I'm wrong. And most of the great things in my life have happened where I thought it was wrong, but I've acknowledged that, you know, maybe it was, so I thought, this, I don't see this book working, but it's Bob. And because it's Bob, I should think maybe, it, maybe it's a good idea. So we got together. It was around Christmas one year at his place in Florida for a day and sat around and brainstormed some ideas. We talked about a few characters, one of whom became Deborah Davenport and a few other ideas. And I went back home and I had a opening in my calendar, like I wasn't working on something else. And I'd never published a book at this point. And I started messing around with Bob's ideas, started playing around, taking this part, kind of writing with it and taking that part and writing with it and playing with the idea. We kicked around on, at his place about this realtor person. And I sort of wrote this scene and it's what's in the chapter in authenticity. And I emailed it to Bob and, and Bob was like, that is awesome. Keep going. So then for the next uh, maybe six weeks, I would every day I would go down and that early morning time I would go down, I would write some stuff. And I would email it off to Bob and he would email back always something that was a variation on the theme of, oh, that's cool. <laughs> and he would have ideas, you know, what about this? Or what if he did that? 
he would have tweaks, changes, or ideas, whatever. I did probably the majority of the heavy lifting in terms of putting the words on the page, but a lot of them were pieces that were sort of recycled, revised ideas from a newsletter I'd written years ago or a blog post Bob had done. You know, we both had sort of this body of work. Same thing with the Go-Giver Leader. The Go-Giver Leader, people who know Bob's stuff will recognize a bunch of his blog posts. People who know my stuff will recognize a bunch of my stuff. It's a lot of sort of the things we've said, the ideas we've had, the experiences we've had over the years that we kind of coalesced into this form of this story. So it's a really fun process. I just did the same thing with a chef, a master chef in, in Houston, Texas. We wrote a, book, a parable together and I took a bunch of his writings and he had a story idea and he had this basic thing and I took that and kind of infused it with a bunch of my own thoughts and experiences and, and went through the same kind of maelstrom process of, of making it all into a story. And uh, it's it's a blast. It's really fun. There's nothing collaborative writing is is really a blast because I find it brings stuff out of me that I didn't know I had in me. That's right. Yeah. I'm going through that process right now with a book that's coming out in December, uh, The Front Row Factor. And this okay. idea of collaboration is so fun for me. It's actually one of the principles of the book is build with friends. And I'm on the yeah. phone yesterday with um, this woman, Sarah, who I'm working with, and we're talking and I'm like, these ideas would have never come out by myself. Like the fact that we're talking about this together is brilliant. I love this. And it's just enjoyable. It's in, I think it's super enjoyable to be in collaboration with the right person, <laughs> with the, with the right person. I think it's super exciting. I have had many collaborative projects that did not make it to full term. Many writing partnerships that I've had to say, have, is it not working? So yeah, right person. It's partnerships are tough. Yeah. Yep. Oh, John, I look at the clock and I know that I'm running out of time here with you. I am just chomping at the bit to keep asking you questions. <laughs> You've been so generous with your time here. I want to ask you a couple of just final last minute questions here. So one question is sort you know, feel free to answer this as quickly or take a moment to expand on it if you like. But as you know, uh, we serve a charity that people who have a life-threatening illness, we put in the front row of their favorite live event. And so we oftentimes talk about with our guests what their take is or their view is on mortality or the end of life. And so I wanted to ask you about, you know, is that something you think about? And when you do, does it, how does it inspire your actions today? Or how does it, how does it help you to live more fully now? And in what ways do you process death? Um, I say the answer to that would be yes and no. Yeah. No, that's, that's, a, that's a big question. Yeah, that's a big question. <laughs> And there are so many places to go with that. Sure. So I, but I will try to be succinct. I guess in a sense, you could say no one knows by definition of concrete, absolute knowing what happens after we die. But I have a, certainly have a very strong sense. I have come to a very strong sense about the, the reality of what happens after, after what we call death, particularly both my parents having gone, and uh, more recently, my wife's mother having gone, and our experience, and both, both my wife, my wife had a sibling who died, I had a child who died so many, sorry. many so years ago. Yeah, my first child. And so we, we both had the experience of people close to us of all ages, you know, passing over, across that veil, through that veil to, the, to this unknown place on the other side. I'm acutely aware of, and completely believe that this is so of, of, a, of a strong influence that we still have after dying, after your body's dead and you, and you go on, that there's, there's a rich, there's a richness of that life after life. I read, I love the writer Neil Gaiman, the way that he expresses sort of paranormal or supernatural kinds of events are all fantasy and, and, and fictional and fantastic, but there's always this, for me, this this powerful tinge of reality about it. And that's sort of how I, how I experienced that idea. For me, my expectation is that there is something unique about this life we have that won't be true in that life. There is something very poignantly special and unique about this life here now that we have. And so, you know, I am acutely aware every day of the question, how can I have the most valuable impact? How can I have the greatest impact? I think often, I used, whenever, used to be whenever I would fly, I would look out the window of a plane down at the earth and I would think, if I crashed right now, how would that be? How would that be if our plane just crashed? And I've come to a point where, you know, it would be okay. It would be okay. I feel like 
I'm happy that the go-giver is out there in the world. Some other things I've done, I have four kids that they're out there in the world. I feel like I've got a thumbprint that makes me feel like it was worthwhile my having been here, but I've got some years still ahead of me. So how can I make the most precious thumbprint? How can I make the most valuable contribution? Every day feels precious. Well, I said to you in the beginning that I uh, really appreciate your impact, John. I'm feeling it. And so uh, I hope and I want your influence for many years to come. And at this point, I've felt it and I'm appreciative of it in a big way. So final questions here are what I would challenge you to answer in either one word or one sentence only gut reaction. You ask much of me, my friend. (laughs) (laughs) Are you ready? Yeah, sure. All right, cool. So gut reaction. Um, What's one book or documentary that you think should be mandatory for all humans to experience? The Alchemist. Do you have a personal mantra or a favorite quote? (laughs) Was that laugh because you can't say that one on air? (laughs) Yeah, mine is a blank. Maybe it'll blurt out me after the next question. Yeah, that's right. It'll come to you. Your brain's working now. In the end, what do you most want to be remembered for? Kindness. What live event? would you most want to see front row? The marriage of one of my kids. What's one thing that our community, the front row community can do in the next 24 hours, let's say, to live life in the front row? Write down on a piece of paper what I love most and share that with someone, whether it's live, on a blog post, whatever, as much with as many people as you can. Make a stand for what I love most. John, that's wonderful. I know we're out of time. Any final thoughts for the Front Row community before we sign off here? The thing that stops most would-be writers from being writers is their critical self-voice, is their critical editorial voice. I think that is maybe true not just of writing, but of most creative apps, including starting a business or doing anything. So I just want to encourage everybody to know where this switch is to your critical voice. It's valuable. There's a time where you need it, but know how to switch it off and switch it on. Uh, John, thank you for that. That's a powerful way to wrap up today. Uh, Thank you again for taking the time. I want to take a second and celebrate you one last time, John, and your contributions to the world, who you are as a human being. I deeply believe that you've made the world a better place. And because of that, my children benefit from you. Um, Ah. I deeply believe that you have a direct impact on my children's lives. And uh, for that, I thank you from the bottom of my heart. We will follow uh, your lead here, uh, the Front Row Foundation, the Front Row Community. We're big fans of the book. We'll continue to share it with people. Everybody go pick up a copy, pick up 10 and share them and uh, and we'll help the world be a better place. John, uh, where do people catch up with you online? Uh, My website. It's where I, it's my hub of everything, johndavidman.com. That's where my blog is. All my books are there. It's, it's all there. Excellent. We'll link to that in the show notes. John, thank you for your time. Have a great one. John, thank you much. Before you go anywhere, I want to say thank you. Thank you for listening today. Thank you for watching today. And we are doing this show for you. So make sure to drop by frontrowfactor.com slash contact. Shoot us an email. Let us know how we're doing. What do you like? What can we do better? We want to make this your favorite show, the one that you have a blast listening to and learn something every single time you tune in. Make sure to check out johndavidman.com and pick up a copy of The Go-Giver, The Go-Giver Leader. Share some with your friends. Speaking of sharing, ask yourself who would benefit from listening to this episode? Who writes or wants to get into writing that would enjoy this chat with John David Mann? Share the episode today. You can get all the episodes at frontrowfactor.com slash podcast. Also, John's Encore episode is out in just a couple of days. Now, it's a short interview, about 10 minutes, and it's questions from our community. So if you haven't asked any yet, make sure to go to frontrowfriends.com, or you can get to it through Front Row Factor's website. But make sure to go to the webpage, the Facebook group that we have, that you can post questions for guests there. I will throw out who we're interviewing, and you tell me what questions you have for them, and I'll ask them on your behalf. Hey, many of you have been asking about our live events. So we have an event. If you're a speaker, a trainer, a facilitator, or you want to be, check out speakertrainerexperience.com. The last two times we've done it, it is sold out. It's awesome. You'll love it. Join our waiting list and hear more when that opens up. Also, if you're a dad out there and you're listening and you want to get away to an experience 
where you can hone your skills as a father. Now, I've got lots of business retreats and personal retreats, but I've never attended a dad's retreat. And I thought, man, if there was one, I would jump all over that. But I decided to take my experience in running live events, my passion for being a dad, I brought them together. We opened up this event. It's invite only. It's a small event. And if you want information, just email us. Just go to frontrowfactor.com slash contact. Shoot me a message and we'll show you how to apply to attend that event. And finally, tell us what you think of the show by writing a quick review on iTunes. It means the world to us. Go to frontrowfactor.com slash review. Tell us what you think, and thanks for sharing the love. Until next time, keep living your life in the front row. That's all for this episode of The Front Row Factor. To discover more simple and effective ways to lead a fearless front row life, visit frontrowfactor.com and subscribe to John's 4 Minutes in the Front Row, where he shares quick stories from real-life experiences. Thanks again for joining us today. We hope our show inspires you to live big, give big, and experience life to the fullest. See you next week on The Front Row Factor.